Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. If you don't have headphones on right now, you might uh, find it a little bit easier to hear with that. My name is Pam Pearson. I'm the director of the International Cryosphere Climate Initiative. Welcome to the Cryosphere Pavilion. I'd like to welcome especially those who are watching online and in the Stockholm and Geneva hubs. Time permitting, there will be a Q&A afterwards. So we'll give a chance to those at the hubs to ask questions first. And you're welcome to also put questions in the chat. And then those of, the, of you in the audience will also have a chance to do so. Um, I want to welcome you to this 50 by 30 coalition event. 50 by 30 refers to the needed 50% by 2030 reductions needed in order to keep the 1.5 degree goal of the Paris Agreement in sight. Uh, there are very few countries, unfortunately, that currently have 2030 goals that are 50 by 30 consistent. But as you'll hear a little bit later, the special report on 1.5 degrees made it very clear that globally we need to reduce emissions 50% by the year 2030. And then the additional 50%, roughly speaking, needs to take place over the ensuing uh, 20 years. If we don't make this goal, and again, very few governments are aiming at this near-term goal, it will be very, very difficult, if not impossible, to remain close to 1.5 degrees. So 50 by 30 is a coalition of cryosphere research organizations from around the world, everywhere from uh, New Zealand to Colorado in the American West that feel it's very important to raise this science, to raise the need for these 50% reductions, because for cryosphere, overshoot simply is not an option. That is why our motto in 50 by 30 is that there's no negotiating with the melting point of ice. That is simply a physical reality. And that physical reality is in many ways the most compelling reason why we need to make the 1.5 degree goal, the 50 by 30 goal. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Yori Rogali from the Grantham Institute and a IPCC author on both the one AR5, the fifth assessment, the sixth assessment, and also a coordinating lead author then on the special report on 1.5 degrees of warming. So Yori, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Pam. And um, also from my side, welcome to this event. Um, to start off, uh, I want to give a bit of the context in terms of where we stand globally uh, for 50 by 30 pathways. Why are we talking about uh, a reduction of 50% by 2030? And uh, where do we stand today in achieving that, uh, that reduction? So what I will draw on from the beginning is the 1.5 degree special report of the IPCC. This was published in 2018. And it was one of the landmark reports where we looked at what is the scientific evidence uh, underpinning the pathways through which we can limit warming to 1.5 or close, around, close to 1.5. And there were a few key ca characteristics of those pathways that really came, um, came to the fore. And here you can see them on this, uh, on, on this slide. On the right-hand side, you can just see the pathways in terms of global carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, they start in 2010, 2020, where we are today. And then you can see that all of these pathways so, show a very steep reduction in carbon dioxide emissions in the next decade. Actually, across all the pathways, they show a 40 to 60% reduction by 2030 relative to 2010 levels. This is for carbon dioxide, this figure for all the greenhouse gases, including methane, nitrous oxide, it is roughly the same number uh, by 2030. The second key milestone in these pathways is that it doesn't stop with a near-term reduction. That near-term reduction is absolutely essential, but the second big milestone is a net zero, uh, net zero carbon dioxide emissions by mid-century, roughly. And that you can see here marked with B. Um, this is net zero carbon dioxide, net zero total greenhouse gas emissions are reached 
slightly later, around two decades later, uh, that in, in, in the 20, around 2070. You can also see that um, in the long term, uh, in order to slowly reduce emissions again from or reduce temperatures again from their peak warming, all these pathways reach net negative carbon dioxide emissions, which basically tries to reverse global warming from its peak level. But at the same time, uh, because of those steep reductions in the near term, they also make sure that peak warming is kept as low as possible. Now, these are just modeling results. And, and so the question is, what is required to achieve these deep reductions? And also there, the IPCC actually looked at what the uh, what would be required to reduce those emissions so deeply. Um, the IPCC wrote a lot about this, uh, slightly too much for a 10 minutes presentation. So let me just say some of the key insights there. Well, to, to limit warming to 1.5, we need rapid, far-reaching changes on an unprecedented scale. And each of those bold words, they actually mean something very specific in the context of 1.5 degree. Rapid means that within the next decade, we need to see changes. If we don't see steep reductions in the next decade, uh, we will have emitted the carbon budget for 1.5. Uh, so carbon, one, keeping warming to 1.5 is already out of the window by then. Far-reaching means that we need to have change and emission reductions in all of the sectors. Nobody is off the hook. We need to change the way in which we produce our energy, in the way, in the way we, we use our land, uh, the way we transport ourselves or the way we design our cities. And finally, also the amount of products we use and how we, and how we produce them. So no sector is off the hook here. And finally, on an unprecedented scale, it really means uh, also geographically and socially, nobody is off the hook. It, it needs to have involvement of all countries, all regions, all stakeholders, uh, both poor and vulnerable populations, and of course, also the powerful lobbies that uh, of established uh, industries that need to change in order to limit warming to 1.5. Then, of course, that is what we should be aiming at. Uh, now, where, where are we? And here I'm drawing on a report that just came out last week. It's uh, part of a annual series of uh, the UN Environment Programme called the Emissions Gap Report. This year we have a kind of uh, a, a bit more provocative uh, front page. Uh, the heat is on, a world of climate promises not yet delivered. And so here on the left-hand side, this is a uh, global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, what we do every year in that report is we show where emissions uh, should be going. Here at the bottom range, to limit warming to 2 degrees, 1.8 or 1.5. And then where they are heading, actually based on current, uh, on current policies. They're in the, in, in the dark, Bordeaux. Um, and then based on conditional and unconditional pledges in orange and purple. And you can see that uh, without too much effort, you can see that there is a large gap between where global emissions are currently going by 2030 and where they should be heading to be on that pathway that doesn't stop in 2030, but continues further to net zero CO2 emissions by 2050. Um, the current updated emissions already improve slightly from the previous version of, of, of NDCs that we had as part of the Paris Agreement, but not yet enough. And that is also why this meeting is so important. Finally, the question is often asked, are these changes feasible? Uh, these are massive changes. Uh, these are very, um, they're very demanding from governments, from people, from industries. Uh, and so is it possible? And this was a question that was also asked to the IPCC, to the 1.5 degree special report. And if the IPCC is asked a simple question, then we come back with a difficult answer. And the difficult answer is that there are six dimensions of feasibilities that uh, should be ticked in order for us to be able to say some, that something is feasible or not. And some of those dimensions, we as scientists can tick ourselves because we have the scientific evidence to respond to these. We can say that within the laws of chemistry and physics, geophysical feasibility, we can limit warming to 1.5. We know that within the carrying capacity of our planet, we can limit warming to 
we have the technologies actually available. Uh, we, we, we know how to do it technologically. So also there, we scientists can uh, respond positively. And we also know that it actually doesn't really cost that much. It's really an investment with some upfront investment that will pay itself back quite rapidly, to be honest. However, the two last boxes here at the bottom are two boxes where we as scientists do not have the answers. And, and that are boxes whether we can socially and culturally make the changes that are required. We need to change some of the, our behaviors. We need to use more public transport. We need to change some of our dietary preferences in order to reduce emissions. And the second one is whether we will make the policy decisions that are required uh, to make this happen in the real world. And here I have this finger pointing into this room because it is this forum now, well, not just this forum, but many fora, uh, this is one of them, where decisions indeed need to be taken uh, to make this uh, reality and to make this feasible uh, from, uh, from the scientific then evidence into action into the real world. And with that, thank you very much. And I would like to hand over to my colleague, Jonathan. Hi. So my name is Jonathan Bamber. I'm director of the Bristol Glaciology Centre and I'm also a professor at Technical University of Munich. Um, Jury's just explained to you how we can achieve 50 by 30 or how we can stay under 1.5 degrees. I'm going to say a few words about why, why we have to do that, uh, why it's absolutely imperative for, for civilization. Um, I'm not going to bombard you with lots of facts and figures. I don't think that's terribly useful. I'm going to keep this relatively short and hopefully time for questions and, and for you to have an opportunity to ask the things that you need to know rather than me guessing what you need to know. So that, that's kind of how I'm going to frame it. Um, and just as a way of introduction, um, I've been studying ice for about four decades now. I did my PhD on glasses in Svalbard. That's in Norwegian Arctic. And I've witnessed with my own eyes the transformation in glaciers and ice cover in that region. And so I've been on a kind of personal journey as well as a scientific journey over the last 40 decades, 40 years, not 40 decades. Um, um, so, and there are three parts of the cryosphere that I want to focus on that are real drivers and, and drivers for this imperative, drivers for why we have to stay below 1.5. Um, there are others in the climate system and there are other parts of the cryosphere, but I think these are the most relevant now. And the first of those is Arctic permafrost. So almost all the permafrost um, around the world uh, resides in the Arctic. Um, there is enough carbon stored in Arctic permafrost to raise global temperatures on their own by three degrees. So if, if we stop emitting tomorrow, um, th there's enough to raise global temperatures by three degrees. And that, you know, obviously the implications of that are pretty disastrous. And the point about Arctic permafrost is that it has a strong positive feedback. Uh, permafrost is fo frozen ground, permanently frozen ground. When it starts to thaw, which it's been doing, uh, it releases that carbon in, in both the form of methane, which is 25 times more, um, uh, you know, uh, has stronger effect than CO2 and as CO2 as well. And if we, if we go above one and a half degrees and um, Arctic permafrost starts to thaw extensively, you get a positive feedback. It warms, you get biological activity below the surface, which keeps it warmer. And you get a, you know, you get a, a feedback that basically you can't stop. And if Arctic permafrost thaws and it releases that carbon, um, we're stuck with that, that process for uh, not, not decades, not centuries, but millennia. To, to recover the carbon stock in the Arctic. I mean, it, it is a, a sort of profoundly serious threshold that we must not pass. Um, the second one is uh, glaciers, mountain glaciers around the world. Um, they're uh, possibly, well, no, definitely not in the UK, but <laughs> for many regions, they're a really important water resource. They're important for tourism. Um, you know, they're, they're a beautiful environment. Um, and again, if we exceed one and a half degrees, there are um, regions of the world, particularly um, tropical glaciers and low latitude glaciers, places like the Alps, um, where we're going to see almost complete loss of glacier cover by 2100. And that has very serious implications for, um, for communities in say tropical areas like the Andes, for example. 
Uh, that's 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 and and for those to recover, we're talking about centuries, multiple centuries to grow back glaciers. The third, which I think has important implications for all of humanity, um, is uh, something called the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. Now, Antarctica is the biggest ice mass on the planet by a factor 10. It's 10 times bigger than Greenland. The West Antarctic Ice Sheet is the bit on the left with the peninsula coming down. And it's, it's resting on bedrock um, that is up to two and a half kilometers below sea level, okay? So it's what's called a marine ice sheet. And its particular geometry means that it's, it has an instability in it. It's called something called the marine ice sheet instability. And if we, if we push the West Antarctic ice sheet a little bit too far, you know, we prod it too much and it passes this critical threshold, then, then humanity is committed to at least three and a half meters of sea level rise from West Antarctica alone. Um, now the time scale for that is, is something that depends on uh, future emissions and you know the, the trajectory of climate. Nonetheless, that is something that we're committed to and that commitment, um, I mean, we're talking multiple millennia. Um, to rec There's no turning back, not on a human time scale for that kind of uh, committed sea level rise. And three and a half meters, I mean, that's, um, you know, it's a sort of unthinkable sea level rise. Just to put it in context, two meters of sea level rise will displace 630 million people now, okay? So that's, that's 150 times more people than was displaced during the Syrian refugee crisis. And we all know what the political consequences and fallout of that were. So I think, you know, the, those, those thresholds, um, we, we just cannot pass for the sake of humanity. And that's actually, I think, all, all I want to say, I, I'll stop there because, you know, I want to ensure there's lots of time for questions. Okay. Okay, well, um, yeah, I'd like to thank Pam for the opportunity to, to come and present uh, today um, on 1.5 degree, national 1.5 degree pathways um, for cryosphere relevant countries. And the reason why it's important to have these 1.5 degree pathways at the national level um, is to gauge whether targets and policies of these countries are uh, aligned with the Paris Agreement's 1.5 degree uh, goal. So I'll just give a quick uh, rundown of the structure of the um, talk today. I'll give a, an introduction to these downscaled uh, modeled emissions pathways, um, then look at some results from uh, three countries that are part of an upcoming briefing that we're doing on um, subarctic countries and 1.5 degree uh, emissions pathways, um, and then put these model pathways into a broader uh, equity context as well, which is uh, really important. So as uh, Yuri's already presented, um, in order to get uh, these, these uh, national level 1.5 degree pathways, we need to downscale from, from IAMs, from integrated assessment model um, emissions pathways. And um, what we're interested in particular is these economy-wide greenhouse gas, gas emission pathways. And um, so IAMs use socioeconomic and, and climate data to produce global and regional scenarios that uh, um, have emissions pathways that correspond to, to various temperature ranges, temperature ranges. And what we're interested in in particular uh, are these 1.5 degree compatible uh, emissions pathways. Um, and uh, this is a graphic that, that Yuri used as well. It's, um, it's the full set of um, 1.5 degree uh, compatible global emissions pathways from the special report on 1.5 degrees from the IPCC. Um, and we can downscale these pathways to the national level using national uh, energy data and also um, socioeconomic uh, projections, so GDP and population growth projections. And um, what we do, Climate Analytics, we, we take this full set of, uh, of emissions pathways and we filter out the ones that um, are considered to have unsustainable levels of carbon dioxide removal. So for example, biomass with um, carbon capture and storage and um, from, the, from that uh, reduced subset of, of pathways, when we take the, 
uh, the median to the fifth percentile. So basically the, the most ambitious half uh, of those pathways. And that's how we create these, um, these temperature ranges. So just introduce the, the upcoming work that we have with these, um, these three countries that we're, that we're looking at. So it's a, it's a briefing looking at um, subarctic countries and uh, ensuring that they are 1.5 degree compatible. So um, we're looking at Scotland, Sweden, and Canada uh, in particular. And the briefing will outline emissions ranges for, for various temperatures um, for each country and then highlight where for those countries, their targets um, and policies are either insufficient or where they are aligned, in fact, with, uh, with the 1.5 degree um, target of the Paris Agreement. Um, and then it also places it in context of, of localized cryosphere impacts uh, as well. So of the three countries, um, Scotland is um, like the most ambitious. It's got a very strong uh, 2030 target. 75% below 1990, it's a, it's a world leading target. Um, and a 2045 net zero target, which is also world leading, especially when you consider that the projected emissions from the land use sector and forestry uh, are projected to be positive in the, in the coming decades. So that makes it even, even harder to, uh, to achieve. You've got to go, go further. You've got to account for these emissions too. It's not a, not a sink. So, um, so at the end of last year, Scotland updated their um, climate change plan. And in that plan, there was a, um, a modeled emissions uh, pathway that showed sectoral emissions reductions that achieves this, um, these very ambitious um, targets, the 2030 target. Um, but what's needed now is uh, to see that the policies are uh, being implemented and, and produced to, to achieve that emissions uh, pathway that's now been, been modeled. Uh, and one thing that was missing, or that is missing, is um, a projection of emissions under current policies so that it's really clear sort of how, how far there is to go. Um, this is, it's one thing to sort of map out, well, this is where we need to go, but it's also uh, it's very useful to have that reference point to say, well, we, you know, where are we now and, and how far do we need to go still? So I thought it'd be useful to make a bit of a comparison with uh, Scotland and the UK because UK is... Um, it's been sort of touted in the media as a, as a, um, a leader on, on, on climate change, and, and they do have a number of ambitious um, policies and targets. But, um, you know, just to put things into perspective, I, I thought it would be useful to, to compare Scotland because they do have uh, a number of targets and policies that are actually more ambitious than, than the UK. So the so UK is sort of out in front of, uh, of the UK in that regard. So as I mentioned, the, the 2030 target of 75% is, is higher than the 68% the of the UK. Um, They've got a, a net zero target that will um, be reached in, uh, in five years before, in 2045 versus 2050. Uh, emissions free heating in new buildings, uh, one year before in 2024. Uh, and then a very ambitious uh, goal to, to create a zero, zero emission rail network by, by 2035. Um, and then just very recently, um, Nicola Sturgeon, the first minister, has come out um, opposing uh, new oil and gas uh, exploration. Uh, something that the UK government um, has as yet um, not been willing to do. So, um, you know, Scotland, in a lot of ways, is really showing the rest of the world that very high levels of ambition uh, are possible. And um, yeah, for, for that reason, Scotland really is a, a prime candidate uh, to, to join the, the 50 by 30 coalition, which is a coalition of governments um, and uh, research institutions, as, as Pam has, has mentioned, that... Um, is aligned with this this goal, this uh, this need to reduce emissions by at least fifty percent by twenty thirty, um, and you know with these world leading targets and, and policies in place, um, it'd be uh, Scotland would be a, a welcome addition to to further this this goal. I'll just quickly go through the other two um, countries that will be included in this upcoming briefing. So Sweden is uh, also a fifty by thirty uh, member, and they also have a, a twenty forty five net zero target, which is um, yeah, quite ambitious. But what's missing for, for Sweden is, a, is an economy-wide 2030 target. So they have um, sectoral targets, they have a transport sector target, they have a non-emissions trading scheme related uh, emissions target. Um, but in order to sort of compare countries uh, appropriately and to be able to gauge you know, where they're at with, with regards to these uh, 1.5 degree um, compatible emissions ranges, you really need a, an economy-wide target. Um, and so that's something that, that Sweden really, um, I think, needs to address as a, as a matter of priority to, 
to make sure that they uh, they enable uh, sort of the gauge of, of where they're at and uh, whether they're 1.5 degree compatible. Um, and as you can see, the, the current policies um, at the moment, it's it's uh, if 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 other countries made similar efforts, it uh, would lead to between two and three degrees of, of warming. So it's one thing to have you know an ambitious uh, net zero target, but uh, you also need to to really make it clear that uh, that those policies are are in place and that you're that you're on the way. And at the moment, um, yeah, it's uh, it's not the case. Um, another thing that's uh, important. So as Scotland has the uh, the climate change plan and that modelled uh, emissions pathway. It's um, important that, that Sweden sort of maps out, well, here are our planned policies and this is where it's going to get us. Because, um, you know, as you saw, uh, at least with, with, uh, with the Scottish uh, modelled emissions pathway, uh, if they achieve that, then it's, um, it's clear to see that, that is on a, a 1.5 degree trajectory. But um, you know, at the moment, Sweden hasn't, uh, hasn't produced that. So it's, it's not clear um, with the policies that they are proposing to put in place uh, whether that's the, the case. Uh, and then the third country um, covered by this briefing is, is Canada. Now, Canada has produced some, some strengthened targets recently, um, have updated their 2030 target uh, quite substantially. Um, but again, as you can see, it's um, still not 1.5 degree compatible yet, um, a minimum of, of 56%, uh, sorry, 54% below 1990 levels by, by 2030 would be the minimum they, they would need to, to achieve that. Well, that's excluding uh, Lulu CF emissions. Um, and then in the, uh, the revised climate plan that they re released, the, the planned policies that they have outlined, um, again, as you can see, it's, um, first of all, it's, it's not quite getting them to, to their 2030 target. Um, and it's also not 1.5 degree uh, compatible. So you know, this newly elected Trudeau government, it's got a, a prime opportunity now, uh, and, and I would say a mandate to um, in, increase the the ambition of these uh, these targets and uh, these policies and and their target to to really make sure that they are 1.5 degree um, compatible. Um, it's a, it's one thing to to have a, a 2050 target, which they've also just um, legislated and, and put in place. Um, you know, net zero by 2050. It's a it's a it's a commendable target, um, but you need to be um, on track to, to to achieve that, and you need to you know have a, a target that's. Um, also strong enough in the medium term, so 2030, to, to really, you know, you need to be within this green shaded area the whole way through. It's not enough to just have a, a net zero target in, in 2050. Um, so one thing that's really important when we talk about these modeled emissions pathways, um, always need to be putting it into an equity context because what a country does domestically in terms of what it um, sets as its target and what it achieves with its, its policies, it's just one part of the story. Um, you really also need to, to make sure if you're a wealthy country that you're contributing adequately to, to global uh, climate finance efforts um, you know, without you know, sufficient assistance to developing countries that also really need to um, reduce their emissions. Uh, we're just not going to be able to get to um, that 1.5 degree goal. And so, um, you know, as you see here on the, on the right, it's sort of different conceptualizations of, um, of equity considerations. And uh, you know, these model pathways, they they don't uh, take these into consideration. So um, what you need to do then is uh, find a way of uh, quantifying that. And so there are um, different ways that you can do that. There's, uh, there's different platforms out there. The Climate Action Tracker is, um, is, a, is a very prominent one that tries to um, rate not just what a country is doing domestically, um, but whether or not they are contributing their fair share to global climate mitigation uh, efforts. And so I've used the example here of, of Germany because it's a, it's a climate action tracker country um, and we've got the, the model domestic pathways here as well. And you can see that that green range on the left, um, it's much, much higher than what is the, the 1.5 degree fair share range down there. It's, uh, it's actually negative, right? So the, the difference there, that would be um, what they would need to contribute in, in, in global climate finance to, to get them to that fair share contribution. And that applies um, to all wealthy countries that do have the, the ability and the wealth to uh, contribute those, those funds to, to help developing countries um, also reduce their emissions. So it's always important to consider that when, when we're talking about these things. Um, yeah, I think that's my time. So I think we may either have some, some time for questions or someone uh, is after me. I'm not really sure, but...
Thanks. Now, we will have time for questions afterward, but now it is my great honor to uh, present the Scotland's Minister for Environment and Land Reform. Please. And um, I should just like to begin by saying thank you so much for giving me the opportunity uh, to speak with you today at this vital summit, at this critical time, and in our beautiful city of Glasgow, a city which is in fact the closest to the Arctic Circle ever to have hosted COP. Um, and while not quite um, geographically an Arctic nation, is the most uh, northerly non-Arctic country. In fact, the, the Shetland Isles uh, in Scotland are on the same latitude as, uh, as Cape Farewell in Greenland. And um, we are, they are closer to the Arctic Circle than London. But of course, it's not just our geographical proximity which makes us good friends and neighbours. It's about the ambitions that we, that we share. Um, so in 2019, we published our first Arctic policy, which was called Arctic... Um, connections and in that we tried to foster more of the connections, um, seek closer cooperation and crucially to cooperate on the shared challenges that we face, uh, including of course the shared challenge of climate change. Now we know um, and some of the speakers that have preceded me today have set out so clearly how climate change is, climate change and nature loss are the single greatest long-term threats that we face and that it is no exaggeration to say that the future of our planet and uh, everything living on it depends on concerted action and action taking now. And it's in the face of that enormous challenge that initiatives such as 50 by 30 are so important. Because none of you here need to be reminded of the centrality of the polar regions in the fight against climate change. With uh, Arctic warming happening twice as quickly than other parts of the world. We in Scotland care deeply about this. We care because it affects our friends and neighbours. Um, we care because it affects us with our coastal communities at risk from rising sea levels. And we care because of the severity of what that means for the world. And the speakers have, have set out that severity so clearly today. So the scale of the challenge and the pace with which we need to move means that collaboration is essential and that the input from these fantastic scientific minds is also um, essential. There are rapid and profound changes uh, that are already underway and we are very proud of um, Scotland's contribution in our science and research industries who have helped drive forward the science behind all this work. Um, indeed, seven Scottish universities are members of the University of the Arctic um, and through the Scottish Alliance of Geoscience, Environment and Society, Scotland is home to Europe's largest glaciology group. We also in the Scottish Government recently confirmed support for new academic networks in Scotland um, to foster even stronger links with the Arctic and several projects which will be funded through our new Arctic Connections Fund we'll see Scottish universities and academics collaborating with colleagues across the Arctic region, both on climate change and on the imperative of a just transition. These scientific minds and this collaboration will be absolutely central to meeting the challenges that we face, but equally to rising to the opportunities that this can uh, have for our communities. And as we collaborate internationally, as we must, Scotland is also trying its very best to lead at home and Ryan set out really thoroughly a lot of what we're doing in Scotland. In fact, it was quite interesting <laughs> to have been part of the development of the climate change plan and then to sit and listen to uh, someone who's far more scientific than me explain it. But just to uh, recap, we are keen not only to be deeply ambitious, but to be able to move quickly. Um, so we announced a climate emergency in 2019 and our parliament moved very quickly thereafter to set the uh, legally, our, our Climate Change Act, which sets the, what we think is the most ambitious framework for emissions reduction in the world. 
and some of the aspects of that were set out. So just to recap, it's net zero by 2045. It's a 75% reduction by 2030. And crucially, there are annual targets in between with a catch-up mechanism, which means that if we miss them as ambitious targets, sadly sometimes are missed, we then have to report on how we will catch up on that. And also interestingly, all of that statute is underpinned by a legal commitment to a just transition, which means that as we pursue these world leading targets, we will do so in a way that leaves no one behind, no community behind. We will take everybody with us. And we are making progress. We have already um, reduced our emissions by 51% since the 1990 baseline. Last year, 96%, nearly all of our um, gross electricity use came from renewable sources. And in my area, as Minister for Environment, we're very fortunate to have ample resources in our natural world to draw upon as nature-based solutions to climate change. So we are planting 80% of the UK's trees in Scotland, and we're investing heavily in uh, restoring our precious peatlands. Who would have thought the answers to the great challenges of the age will lie in the mud in Northern Scotland? Um, but it's amazing the way that they will sequester carbon, support biodiversity, and we hope create good green jobs in our rural communities, which of course is part of our um, just transition plans. And all of that is set out in our nationally determined contribution, which we took the step to produce prior to uh, hosting COP. So with all that in mind, I am so delighted truly uh, to accept your very kind invitation for Scotland to join the 50 by 30 uh, coalition. We are so proud of the progress that we've made to date, but we are crystal clear that there is so much work still to do. Um, and we're clear that collaboration has to be at the heart of that. The road to net zero, it is going to be very challenging, but it's a road that we absolutely have to walk together. Uh, because as has so eloquently been set out in the 50 by 30 mission statement, we cannot negotiate with the mel melting point of ice. So thank you all very, very much. And I hope to continue working with you. Thank you so much for that uh, very welcome declaration. I'm especially impressed, I have to say, I was not aware of the yearly targets and the catch-up mechanism because that's so important for other governments, especially at this COP, to really implement those kinds of, of policies. Um, if there are questions, are there any questions from either of the hubs? Okay, uh, any questions online? Okay, so if there are questions from the audience, then if you would come to this microphone, we'll activate it. Um, and we're uh, quite eager to hear from uh, any of you. Yeah. So if I might ask a question then, uh, could you talk a little bit more then about the, this catch-up mechanism and how that would work, how the annual targets would work? That would be really interesting. Yeah, no, I'm glad to talk about the catch-up mechanism. And we'll start by saying, unfortunately, we have had to utilize it, um, which is unfortunate, but I think it demonstrates the importance of, of why it's there. Um, so we have met a number of our annual targets. We have missed a number. Crucially in that, I think something that I take great comfort in is that there is a lag in the, the, in the data so that so much of what we did this year isn't captured. But where we miss them, um, the part we are required, the Scottish Government is required to present to Parliament a plan much like the climate change plan that you've been studying, which demonstrates how the emissions gap will be closed between what was the target and where we eventually came in that year. And uh, we did miss the most recent target. And therefore, just a number of weeks before COP26, we laid in the Scottish Parliament a catch-up report, which demonstrates how we'll, how we'll make the gap. So there's something about, you know, being exceptionally ambitious does mean that um, there won't always be times when we will meet our objectives, but it's not a reason to stop and we just have to keep pushing on. Thank you. 
Thank you. And I'd say that's that's actually a very welcome addition to the, the 50 by 30 reason in many ways of being an example. Uh, all of the 50 by 30 consistent governments have actually climate committees or something along those lines that are benchmarking groups that say whether or not a government is on track. Um, but in most cases, such as the UK, for example, they're often saying the government is not on track, but there's no mechanism built into the law to bring it back on track again. So I think that's a really needed innovation. Um, so if there are, yeah, questions, two questions. Yeah, I, I, I was the author of the IPCC report and I also sit on the UK Government Climate Change Committee. But I've got, um, m the question I've got is what about kind of differential kind of responsibility? By trying to set this 50 by 30 target, you're really excluding a lot of the developing countries. I mean, you, you, really, you really can't kind of paint different countries with the with the, exactly the same kind of, kind, of, kind of targets. So I just wonder what you can try and do to try and kind of bring those developing countries in. And uh, I'm happy to hear more from Ryan on this as well. Yori would have been good, but basically part of the reason for that is that um, the analysis needs to be done on those countries, number one. Uh, number two is that to be 1.5 consistent, we, we feel like it's important for the industrialized nations, for those few who are 1.5 consistent, to be raised up. Because I think a lot of people are hearing in the media and elsewhere, and we see this especially in the cryosphere world, people will say, well, we've lost the Arctic or there's no way to make 1.5 degrees. So part of what we're trying to do is lift up the industrialized nations and in saying that it is possible, and this is how it's been done, this is how it can be done. But I agree with you, I think it's equally important to lift up developing countries to say, and this is how developing countries can do this. And a lot of that, of course, is finance, and that's one of the biggest uh, issues at this COP. So please, yeah. First of all, thank you so much for a um, very fascinating presentation. My name is Hatla Lohatotter. I'm a co-founder of the Arctic Initiative at the Harvard Kennedy School and the Director General of uh, Iceland's National Energy Authority. And I'm uh, curious, when in implementation of your ambitious plan, can you speak a bit about the challenges, for an example, related to siting of energy projects in the context of wind energy and so forth, and how you're tackling uh, the differences that come along uh, with with, with uh, finding and implementing solutions. So, thank you. Thank you very much for an excellent question. Um, yeah, th th I think it goes back to that point that I made before that um, the scale of what we're facing and the speed that we need to address it in, and I, do, I don't mind admitting, is not something that government is actually used to acting as nimbly and as quickly to respond to. So that in and, in and of itself is a challenge. And I think my colleagues in the Scottish government would agree that since the declaration of the climate emergency, there has been a real step change in the way that our directorates work to consider the what everything that we are doing, be it in health, be it in the transport department, be it in food and agriculture, challenging ourselves on what we're doing. But on the ground, and I was saying this this morning, one of the great joys of being a minister is that you're also a member of parliament and your job is to be in your constituency and speaking to people. And one of the most, one of the greatest challenges is about the way that it affects people in their everyday life. Um, and especially, for example, in oil and gas, as we have made very clear that continued unlimited um, extraction of hydrocarbons is not in line with our climate goals. And therefore, our oil and gas industry has to change, change rapidly and change fairly. So that comes back to our commitment to a just transition. One of the biggest challenges will be moving quickly enough, but doing it in a way that's fair to our people, doesn't create um, economic dislocation, examples of which are still felt throughout Scotland from when we last had a big shift when our steelworks and our coal mines closed in the 90s and 80s, 80s and 90s. 
So it's that balance of sufficiently ambitious and doing it in a way that is fair and takes everybody with us. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, I will add on to this that uh, we actually are having a side event during week two uh, on Thursday that is focused on the just transition. Um, the minister's counterpart for a just transition will be taking part in that event, and uh, we look forward to hosting it. So if there are no more questions, we'll... Uh, oh, one more question, please, Twyla. Yeah. Um, I'm Twyla Moon. I'm a cryosphere scientist. I study the Greenland ice sheet in the Arctic, and it's, it's I'm just so, so pleased to hear from you and to um, welcome Scotland to the 50 by 30 coalition. Uh, it feels truly fantastic. And um, what I would like to um, hear is uh, your thoughts as far as scientists um, we're we're so close to the information and kind of an awareness of what the possi the possibilities of the future could hold. Um, how wonderful it could be if we we are all to take the ambitious actions that are possible, um, and and the world that we could live in. Um, but we don't always know kind of where where to find the people to bring on board. And I wonder, if, for you, who are the people um, that you would like to be? becoming more familiar with, with the science and, and the possibilities? Is it, is it policy or business or perhaps constituents and the public? Um, where, would you, where would you like to, to see us um, stretching our wings and, and trying our best to communicate? Thank you so much for your question. It's lovely to meet you as well. Um, I think that first of all, as scientists, the answers to so much of this are in your minds. So we're so grateful to have you. But I, I also acknowledge that it must be so burdensome, actually, because for, you know, one of your colleagues said he'd been studying ice for 40 years. You have known about this impending situation for such a long time in all its complexity. You've understood that. So it must be a relief somewhat that now I think public consciousness is starting to pick up. Um, and I hope you feel that we're at a better time than ever to take action on that. But you're right. I think the biggest challenge is um, probably twofold. One is translating the science in a way that is understandable to the public at large. And I think probably politicians have got a role to do in that um, because we are that interface between policy development and the public. And we've got a job to um, engage and to reach out. And one of the things that we've done in Scotland is we hosted a citizens assembly which invited people randomly from all over the country to come together and to assess what we could do um, in climate objectives in every single, um, right across our economy and society. And they gave us a very fulsome report and we are now considering how we can implement it. And that to me was really important because it said, this is what the public say they want us to do. And, and actually very much it was about not allowing it to fall on the shoulders of the individual and calling to business, which is the second point, we absolutely have to encourage business and the private sector to lead the way because uh, the government can't do this alone, the public sector can't do this alone, not just uh, in our position of influence, but equally with, with funding. So we need to demonstrate to business, not just the risks of inaction, but the opportunities of action. Um, and that's something that we're also trying to do. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, coming to this event. We're so pleased to welcome uh, Scotland to the 50 by 30 coalition. And uh, please check out the entire program of the pavilion at uh, www.iccinet.org. Uh, and it's on the homepage there. You can look at every day uh, and watch it online as well as uh, welcome to come here to the pavilion also. So thank you very much. Thank you, Minister.